You're listening to Republic Broadcasting Network because you can handle the truth. Truth, truth, truth. guest the last two hours today is Michael S. Heath, H-E-A-T-H. His website is michaelheath.org. And um, I read, uh, Michael, welcome. First of all, have you say hello. <laughs> then we good, go good to be on with you. Good to be on oh, with it's, you. It's wonderful to have you on. I, uh, I read an article that you wrote on News of Views, and I thought, holy cow, um, what a great article. And then I went back to it and, and and got the old 404 or some such thing. It wasn't there anymore. It had totally disappeared at, into <laughs> into space somewhere. And, memory uh, hole. It went yeah, down the memory, memory hole. hole. ate it up. And uh, so I thought, well, I was surprised to see uh, that uh, that it was published to begin with because I wrote for News with Views for uh, several years, uh, began with them in 2005, and wrote lots of articles. And um, for the most part, they published most of them. There were some that they didn't publish, and um and then i i had there there are wonderful wonderful sites to write for uh but they have a, a certain guidelines and um i i didn't always follow the guidelines and apparently i uh, you ran into the same problem and um so anyway i have made that article uh, there's a link to it, uh, which you provide, uh, to that article, and I will post it in the chat room. So tell us a little bit about the article that you wrote and why it was removed. Yeah, I write one every day, so let me just go pull it up again. I, I read it just the one on cultural Marxism, right? Right. Which is obviously a naughty article to be writing <laughs> oh here it is cultural marxism and toxic eschatology the reason i hesitated deanna is um make a there's a longer story to this and just tell me if you're interested in it but the short story is i started writing again in may and i used to write every day uh, back when email first came along and then i stopped reasons we get into or not, but it's just kind of a long story. And I started writing again in May, and I decided to write every day a newspaper-length column. I don't pitch it to anybody. I don't go to newspapers. I don't, I'm not, I don't have an agent or anything like that. I just publish it on my website every day. And News with Views expressed an interest in I, – I mean, I approached them through a friend earlier this year, and – they said yes to publishing one of the columns. Actually, they said they might publish more than one because I five a week. Um, and it ended up being, I think, that they're publishing uh, one a week on Sundays and sending it out to their email. So it appears on their website, and it also gets sent out to their email blast list on Sundays. And this is the one that went out, I think it was three or four weeks ago, and it disappeared almost as fast as it appeared. Apparently... It went out in the email. I don't choose this column for News with Views. They choose the one from that week's out. Sure. And and then and then they publish it, and they don't tell me what they're going to publish. So it appeared in the email apparently, and then it disappeared almost as fast as it appeared, and uh, a different article was put in its place. Nobody from News with Views called me either before the article was published or after it was changed. So I I don't know from them why they did that. Right. Now when I when I used to write for them, I would submit an article 
um, usually once a week. And uh, there were some that they did not publish. Um, and so I kind of got used to uh, seeing what what they would publish or not publish. And so I recognized that they had certain viewpoints that they didn't want to to prom- they ha- they had had some reservations about certain viewpoints that that um, they wouldn't publish and they would tell me uh, that they weren't going to publish it or yeah they wouldn't publish it <laughs> mm-hmm. so so I I was uh, not I was surprised that they published your article I thought holy cow uh this they must have changed their uh their their uh requirements or something and uh, so the next day I went back and wasn't there it just disappeared yeah, into I cyber suspect, sex. I suspect Deanna, that the offending idea in this column is this one and it came at the very end America's situation is the result of cultural Marxism and toxic eschatology related to the over-century-old Jewish campaign to create anew the religious nation-state of Israel, the Earth's most dedicated proponent of porn. And uh, and, that uh, probably was the, the, the sentence that pretty much did your article in. Yeah, that, that would be my guess. The entire article is uh, not about it's not an attack on Zionism. It's it it's sort of a soft critique of culture, and not it's a critique. It's it's a, it's about cultural Marxism, and uh, the the whole subject of Israel comes in as a you know, sort of under that umbrella. But it's it's not an article about that subject. So, um, I've written a couple. I've written a few columns where I touch on it, and. But only a few. I've, I've written 150 columns since uh, March of this year, and I think maybe three or four of them have touched on the uh, subject of Zionism. And the reason I'm starting to tease that subject in my thinking is because I'm not allowed to. I mean, that's why I'm interested in it in the first place, is because if I think the word Jew, I immediately instinctively feel guilty. And it's like I can't think about it if it's negative. Now, if it's positive, if, I, if I'm going to think about um, Judaism or, or Israel or Jewishness in a way that is affirmative or that, I mean, I'm, I really, I almost, uh, I almost feel elated if I think of it in terms of the Holocaust. As, and, and if I feel guilty for the Holocaust, Holocaust then, then I, I feel okay about it. And um, so I'm curious, right? I'm, I'm, and so I'm reading about it. So I've discovered this uh, author, scholar named Dr. E. Michael Jones on the Internet. Oh, I love listening. him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, listen, I'm listening, to, listening to his lectures and, and to his... Uh, I'm listening to what I can access on YouTube, but lots of interviews with him mm-hmm. back a number of years. And uh, now I'm, I bought his book, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. I'm reading that over a thousand mm-hmm. pages. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious. I'm not hateful. I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm going to end up in this journey in thinking about this issue. But I am writing about it along the way as I produce these columns. And and what I'm writing is is not uh, singing the praises of of Zionism to the extent I I don't claim I'm no Deanna I'm no expert on it <laughs> either for or against it I'm just I'm just starting to uh, among the many things I'm interested in it's one of the things that I'm uh, thinking about. Um. A. Michael Jones has produced, I have his book, and I, I did interview him at one time. Um, but there are things, obviously, that we're not supposed to talk about. Um, and uh, 
There's a saying, I'm trying to think of what, what it is. I probably have it posted on one of my, um, uh, truth uh, can withstand the most intense scrutiny and does not fear investigation, but rather invites exploration. If you think you can or think you can't, you're right. But uh, truth, I think, basically uh, does not fear investigation. And, um, however, there we've been programmed to not not investigate certain things uh, because we might feel guilty about them or we've been programmed not to ask questions and we're we're all kind of herd animals and so we we tend to stick together with in a consensus uh, kind of a situation where um, where we don't ask questions because we don't want to be that that one individual in the class who has a different opinion. Consensus is is the most popular thing to be doing, uh, but so asking questions um, that that uh, raise other questions is probably not the thing to do. Um, so well, I, I'm 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 no stranger to sort of being the outlier, or the guy in the the one guy in the class who raises his hand and asks the question that nobody else would would ask. Right. I back in the early 1990s became the leader of a statewide group in Maine, and that group, uh, history of that group, the Christian Civic League of Maine, reaches back to. The spring of 1897. So when I was the leader of the group, and I was leading it for about 20 years. It was it crossed its uh, century mark of, of ministry in Maine. And one of the things that the board and I decided to do during my tenure over the, those two decades was to bring to the people of Maine the idea that homosexuality ought not be approved in a matter of law and policy in any way in, in Maine. And so I was the spokesman for that point of view and as the leader of the Christian Civic League of Maine. So in other words, I got to work in politics and in the media uh, with Christianity in the headline, so to speak, during a time when uh, it's, I'm increasingly unpopular, if not irrelevant, to bring a Christian or religious perspective into politics. And what made it even worse was the fact that the group, to its credit, in my view, decided to say no to gay rights and argue the point that that we ought not go in this direction as a civilization, as a state, as a body politic. And... Uh, we were respectful. We were we never worked to silence or censor anybody, which is uh, kind of interesting, since that's become it appears the most uh, popular uh, tactic of the left now is to just turn people off, just not allow them to speak at all. Uh, that was never our attitude in the nineties when we debated this topic. And we ended up taking the issue to the ballot more than once. So what the group determined in the, the Christian Civic League determined in the uh, late 80s, early 90s was that uh, we would be wasting money to spend any time or money on lobbying legislators because we concluded that the, the uh, representatives that the, what, for whatever reason, the, the culture being toxic in the state house, whatever the reason, the manipulation, probably all of the above, um, we weren't, we were going to lose that fight if we went at it with a lobbying strategy. So we decided to use a populist strategy. We decided to use the referendum and seek to persuade uh, the people through debate that we were right. And we did. In 1998, uh, 1998, the legislature passed 
gay rights. They added sexual orientation to the Human Rights Act. And we uh, set out to gather 10% of the last gubernatorial elections uh, signatures in three months. Big task. And we did it. So we forced the issue to the ballot for what's called a people's veto in Maine. People have the right to overturn a law that the legislature has passed and the governor has signed. So this law, gay rights, had been passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, and was headed into the law books. And we launched this populist campaign, and we were outspent. You can imagine. You can tell the rest of the story with respect to the politics of it, I'm sure. And uh, so the vote was held, and we won. They lost. And wow. So then they wouldn't let it rest. So they persuaded the legislature. Uh, they they were uncomfortable just ignoring the people's veto, and so they they re, they argued that because there was a, a <laughs> this the story is kind of I'm chuckling because that vote that people's veto vote because of the way the Constitution in Maine was written at that time was held on February third. It was very early in February. In Maine. Deanna, do you know what happens in Maine in February? you know what Maine is like in February? Uh, probably nothing's happening at all. Well, it's a sheet of ice and right. snow. I mean, it, it is snow two to three feet thick, right. you know, a couple of feet thick that's piled up starting in December, and it doesn't melt. It was winter, and it's the heart of winter in February. And they held the vote statewide. And it was a single issue vote. There was no other issue on the ballot, no representatives, no no other no local actions. It was just that one issue um, on the ballot. And two weeks, yeah, about two weeks, just under two weeks before that vote was held statewide, uh, an ice storm swept from the west to the east and destroyed the electrical grid in the southern part of Maine, which is where the population is located. And for two and a half weeks, I had no electricity. I was among tens wow. of thousands of Mainers who had no power. We couldn't. The roads were plugged up because trees had knocked down, had been knocked down everywhere. It was a real mess. It was it was a sort of an epic uh, natural disaster. And then uh, the vote was was held. They held it anyway. I'm sure the left was thinking it would drive down the turnout. I think the turnout ended up, up ended up being uh, the end up. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the turnout ended up being very high, given the circle, very high. But it was still not the turnout of a general election. So the so the so the left was uncomfortable uh, just passing gay rights the next time the legislature met after we had vetoed it, and so they they created another vote at the end. They put the issue, the same issue, on the ballot for a second time. They didn't force the homosexual rights uh, group to go out and gather signatures like we were forced to do. They just put the issue on the ballot. This is about two, maybe, separating the two votes. And they put it on a ballot when there was going to be a turnout that they, a high, I guess they put it on a high turnout. Yeah, they did, a high turnout uh, ballot. And so they held the vote and they, really outspent us that time. Really, really, like 10 to 1 or more. And uh, so people voted, and we we won again. Wow. That was in 2001, I think it was. So this made me public enemy number one <laughs> in, 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 the, in the media, and I lived like that for many years. I was the state's bigot for years. And I was the go-to guy as the bigot, the hater. I never got a fair shake, ever, not once, in the uh, media in Maine. And that was before the Internet had taken off, around the time when email had emerged. But the Internet wasn't really a thing yet. I think Google came along, what, in 2000, right around that same time. And uh, so there wasn't, 
I just had to take it. I just had to sort of exist in that mainstream media culture, uh, having been a victor, you know, having having stopped this cherished goal of the left, which is approval of homosexuality. And so <laughs> the story gets even more interesting, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause there to see if this is It's amazing to me that that the left, quote-unquote, has such a, um, so much influence that people would abandon that most people simply by listening to the left or, or being allowed to program themselves to accept the, the so-called leftist views of things. It's amazing to me that they would abandon what most of us kind of grew up with. Um, that that takes a lot of programming and a lot of um, I, I don't especially know. on especially Deanna on such uh, on what would seem to be such sort of uh, wait, wait, issues like what is a family or what is marriage, right. Uh, the basic unit of society. Right. It's. I mean, in our in my life, I'm 58. In my lifetime, I can remember that when I was growing up as a child, these weren't. You didn't even think these thoughts. I mean, you cherished family. You knew marriage was a good thing, a noble institution. And you right. didn't, it didn't even occur. To, it, it didn't even occur to you that marriage might include two men or two women. It didn't even occur to you when I was growing up. It wasn't even a thing at all. And, and uh, I, I look at it a lot of, well, I don't. I don't watch TV. I have it on, uh, usually on mute. And um, because when I get a telephone call, I have, I have a program so that I can see who's calling up in the right-hand side of my screen, so I don't have to answer phone calls that I don't want to. Uh, but I do watch Jeopardy, and I watch Wheel of Fortune. Those are just, they've been around for a long time, and they, they kind of challenge your mind a bit. Uh, but some of the commercials and some of the, uh, the people that they have on, uh, like yesterday, on um, oh gosh, it's just amazing to me. They are promoting a lifestyle. There was two. There was a contestant on last night um, who who he was a, a male contestant, and he referred to his husband. I thought, oh gosh, do they even have to push this on? Wheel of Fortune. This is a family show that has been around for well, 37 years. Uh, it, it just it's a family show and this guy's talking about his husband and then uh, one of the commercials when you're, when you're looking at a commercial uh, if you close your eyes and just listen to it um, since we get a lot of our, since most people, 75% of the population are visual, and so they take in most of their information visually. But if you close your eyes and just listen, uh, you'll get all this negative stuff. Oh, you're gonna, you might die, you might have a heart injury, you might, it, all these things that could go wrong with you if you take a, a certain prescription or, or drug. Uh, but I noted also that there are, um, oh, where you sign up to meet singles. They now have, oh, this is just, just uh, really something. They now have a commercial that uh, for a gentleman who's looking for companionship, they bring up these websites that just have male companions. So 
when you're absent-mindedly watching TV, or and they also bring up if you're a, a female and you're looking for an intimate companion, uh, they bring up these these um, advertisements showing all women and think, oh my gosh, this is so subtle. It's it's really promoting. Uh, well, it's, it's, I guess that's why they call it programming, is that they are promoting something that is totally different than the views that most of us have have had that a unit, a family unit, consists of a male, a female, and they have children. That That's what they do. And I remember... Um, as a as a child, I remember that there was talk. My, my parents talked about this one gentleman at work who liked men, and um, they also referred to this one TV personality that uh, apparently was also liked men. Instead of calling. Um, Call, uh, calling Perry Mason, Perry Mason, they'd say, uh, what was it that they called him? Fairy, uh, fairy, oh, what was it? A uh, fairy Mason, fairy Mason, fairy Mason, or something like that. I thought, oh my gosh, that strong person on TV is, but that's, uh, yeah. Well, Deanna, right. this was probably that was a shock to me. Yeah, go ahead. My column, I wrote, I wrote a column this morning. Um, I, I, almost, I almost hesitate to use the word, but I mean, we, we, we believe in free speech here. Right. Part of the. So, so the word, the word, the word I'm going to use, I feel kind of like the thinking about the the Jewish Sodomite. Right. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yes, yes it's, in, uh, so I wrote, it's in the Bible. I, I, my, column yes. for t- my, my column for today is about that word because um, I, I like to say that I was I was allowed, I, gave, I got permission from the culture to use uh, the wrong S word in the debate, but I did it anyway because at least I could inject some truth in, not all the truth, but some of it, and the S word that I had the permission to debate with was sexual orientation. So I had to use that S word uh, when the accurate S word that should be used to help people understand what's at issue in the so-called gay rights debate is the word sodomite. And it's precisely because the word makes us feel uncomfortable that we should use it. Because the the word makes us feel uncomfortable because it because it instinctively and immediately and instantly conveys uh, a personal attribute. It's about a choice that a person makes. Right. To, uh, engage in a particular activity. And right. That is precisely what we're debating. We're not debating sexual orientation. This is. We're, we're debating whether or not that idea that uh, that what, what that what got sodomy destroyed, sodomy and Gomorrah, which was a violent male gang banging on Lot's door and demanding sex with male angels, right? Uh. Uh, it, it, that's what's being debated here, and it is right. very personal. And you know who, Deanna? You know who the most uh, vigorous, my most vigorous. Uh, opponents to the, for the use of the word sodomy in this debate and sodomite, sodomy and sodomite, uh, is, are the pastors. The pastors. Of, Holy of the cow! Oh, <laughs> how appropriate, right? <laughs> Holy uh, cow! <laughs> we'll be right back after three minutes uh, break.
You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. guest, Michael Heath. His website is michaelheath.org. His last name is spelled H-E-A-T-H. Um, and um, I said, holy cow. Uh, but, when you, but when you say, um, okay, a sodomite as opposed to sexual orientation, sexual orientation makes it sound like Oh, this is something that I couldn't tell, that I can't help. It's just the way that I made, and oh well, it it takes. It sounds, it sounds, so, it sounds so innocent and benign, right? And it hides the it hides the fact that what has been created by the use of that word is the society wide approval, civilization wide approval, actually, if you step back and take a look at this issue in terms of the West. I mean, one of the issues boiling within the Roman Catholic Church right now with this current Pope is this very issue. And uh, so it's not it's not confined to some little town in Texas or Maine or some state in America or to the United States. This, this is a crisis within Western civilization that touches on what a fam the uh, the essence of what a family is. What does the word family refer to? What is a family? We take for granted most of us that uh, a family includes the idea of marriage. Necessarily concludes the idea definition, and that marriage includes the idea of father and a mother. Why? And that really has very little to do with sexual pleasure. All of that has much more to do with uh, the, the duty that humans have to future generations. First of all, to the children who are brought into the world by that union of a father and a mother. And then to the grandchildren and the great, you know, the, the, like, the, what follows down through time from the right ordering of this category within our experience called family and this debate over sexual orientation which is really a debate about sodomy the debate about whether it's right for a man and a man and a woman and a woman to, to be in love and they don't even mean love what they mean is to have sex with one another to to engage in sex sex in such a way that they experience pleasure and the has They've completely separated the whole idea of that pleasure or that sexuality being uh, connected in nature and in biology to the creation of a new human being. Life, they separated that out completely. That's, those two things are divorced. And, and in fact, not only have they divorced those two things, but they have now, we have now, our civilization has now, the West has now elevated the pleasure part of sexuality over the duty to life, the duty to new life, the duty that we yeah. have, the responsibility right. that we have to our children and to our grandchildren and to our and to future generations yet unborn. We have a duty, a responsibility, and it and we we that duty comes upon us, that responsibility uh, becomes our own because of sexuality, because we engage in sexuality. Um, you know, to, to mess this up is so risky at best in terms of the present and the future. And also the past, Deanna, if you stop and think about it, because um, this divorces us from any sort of interest in our ancestry. And because... You know, uh, you, you break the connection to ancestors because there's no longer you don't have right. There is no you don't ancestry. Have <laughs> right. 
I mean, you destroy the past, the present, and the future if you win this fight. If you, right. if you, yeah. it, it, exactly. It's, it's you so diabolical. It. It's so diabolical. It is absolutely it's diabolical, and uh, the way that you present it is um, is very good because. Uh, Yes, it's all about it's all about pleasure. Uh, and what is that saying to the child when they couldn't even do family history? How how are they going to do family history? Well, here's one for you, Deanna, which is which is very current. We are seri- half of our country right now. Half of the politically serious part of our country is very, very, very. Rock dead seriously considering making a man, I'll put that in quotes, a male, for now anyway, uh, who considers himself to be the wife, I guess. And I, I, I'm not sure if he uses that. I and mean, this stuff is so absurd, I don't pay close attention to it. But this uh, mayor from Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, is, considers himself to be the, the womanish side of the the so-called marriage that he has, not a marriage, but with another man. And we're serious. Half of our country is seriously considering making this guy president of the United States. Oh, my gosh. And uh, get this. He he grew up three or four do- doors down on the same street that E. Michael Jones uh, raised his children on. Michael Jones and his wife had five children, and they live on a street in, in uh, whatever that town is that Pete is the mayor of in Indiana. And uh, Jones, Jones's children grew up with Mayor Pete Buttigieg, just down the road. And uh, Jones was fired from St. Mary's because he was pro-life just after he got his Ph.D. in American literature, thirty almost 40 years ago now, and the father of Pete Buttigieg became a hero at Notre Dame, Roman Catholic University, uh, for being the one of the nation's leading cultural Marxists. So pro-life Jones, who went on to found the magazine Culture Wars and write over 30 books now in an independent fashion and had to walk away from his... Uh, professorial career he wanted to be a college professor in American literature so he's lived, grows up literally grows up on the same street as Buttigieg Professor Buttigieg who has a son named Pete who's now running for President of the United States because he's a homosexual this is his credential that makes him qualified to lead the nation's only the world's only superpower Wrap your mind around that one. I'm speechless. Oh, my goodness. Now, this Pete, um, how do you pronounce his last name, Buddha? Buddhajish. He's he's one of the gaggle, right, of Democrat candidates for president right now. And he's a, he's a mayor of South Bend? He is the mayor of Oh my gosh! And I guess and he, I don't follow it closely, but apparently he's he's got he's got a lot of uh, power being taken very seriously by the Democrats in their primary. Oh my gosh! Um. Oh my goodness! I guess I I have not been paying attention to uh, potential upcoming presidential elections. Uh, you hear about uh, Bloomberg and all you know these people uh, entering the race, uh, but the Democrats are actually looking at this gentleman. Oh my gosh. 
very, very kind to use that word in this context. Oh, my he's, gosh. He's He's been at it now, I think, since the summer or... I think he's been right. on, in all the debates. Mercifully, right. I, haven't had to, I haven't had time to... Apparently, he, came, he publicly came out as being gay. Now, gay, even the word it is inappropriate. Uh, gay means something happy. Gay used to mean some, somebody that's happy. But now oh, they've... They've perversion, made the, right? uh, the yes, it's a perversion. But now they've made it. Um, they've altered the word. Uh, no, gay is no longer uh, describes somebody's happy happiness. It, it uh, oh gosh, they've subverted subverted the word. They've taken it and given it a new meaning. Um, that it it's actually the opposite. Of it's of the truth, right? This lifestyle, this this so-called lifestyle is not a lifestyle at all. It's a death style. It leads to death. It doesn't produce. It's not see biologically, it's not even capable of producing. Right. The only, that, the only way that any sort of parenting or anything like that can happen in these so-called families is through artificial means, either through adoption or through some kind of not right. natural. And and the actual act itself, I mean, I don't want to gross everybody out, and I'm not going to go too far with this, but the actual act itself between men is precisely the opposite. In precise terms, biologically, it's the opposite of uh, what produces life. I'll stop there. I'll let people's imagination carry it the rest of the way. But it's precisely the opposite of what the All right. what sex problem is about. It produces death. It's about death. The act itself is an expression of an death because of right public airwaves. But um, so, and we never talk. We don't even we don't talk about these things. We don't debate these things. The only thing that comes up when this subject is raised that the fact that all Christians are haters because, and, and Christians have, have brought this on board to such a deep degree that the very first thing that a Christian says whenever this topic comes up is, now I, you know, I want to be quick to, to say before I offer my opinion, which might be somewhat critical of homosexuality, I just want to be quick to say that I don't hate anybody. I don't hate. You know, so we're apologizing out of the gate. So, we're, we're, we're asking to lose. We're projecting weakness before we even start. And everybody's doing this. And uh, we've got to change that mindset and that attitude. We have to be firm in our convictions. We, have to, we don't have to tell people we don't hate them. I don't hate people who sin. I don't hate anybody who sins. Right. I sin. I don't hate sinners. I love sinners. That's why I've done what I've done in, in, in walking away from my lobbying career because the pastors and because Christianity lost its will to fight, lost its will to tell the truth, no matter the cost. And Christianity isn't Christianity if it's not going to if it's not going to represent itself accurately to the public on the issue of human sexuality and what makes a family and what a marriage is. This is not something that is hard to debate. A, a Christian can enter into this debate with respect for their adversary and the person who disagrees with them um, without either, you know, without apologizing for, for, the, for their position and while articulating the position clearly and while allowing that person to, to defeat them in debate or to even kill them because at the heart of Christianity is the cross. And we're supposed to take up our cross every day and follow after who? Follow after Jesus Christ. So what does that mean to take up your cross? Anyway, it was the Romans who used the, tro the cross as an instrument of torture, death. 
And mm-hmm. we we are now called to be people, Christians I'm talking about. We are now right. called, we, we now have the opportunity to speak to Rome, speak to Caesar, speak to power. From the library, the local library, which is making all these grave mistakes with the a drag queens, all the way up to the President of the United States, we have the opportunity to carry our cross and to power and leave the rest up to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what, Deanna? I am so hopeful because I'm beginning to see uh, this happen, especially among young people, among uh, millennials. I'm beginning to see this start to happen. But pe- people are waking up in the West with what I'm talking about. And I'm hopeful. I- I'm not gloomy at all. I-, I described it the other day this way. I said, I feel like we've been devolving my whole lifetime on this issue of human sexuality and the family and marriage. And I feel like we're bumping across the bottom. I feel like we've hit bottom and we're bumping across the bottom. Things haven't started to turn up, but we're bumping across the bottom on this particular issue. I think things are turning up on the question of whether or not we should uh, kill babies in the womb. Portion, but uh. Oh, just just this terrible! Oh, it's terrible, terrible. And I think and I think things are turning up on that. I don't think we're bumping across the bottom on that one politically and speaking, but I still think we're bumping across the bottom of the. I, but I don't. But I don't think we're still going downhill. I think this whole transgendering thing is. People are just. People are just shaking their heads, and it's. I think it's making a lot of people curious as to where did this come from? Where where did this idea that drag queens should read children's stories to my grandchildren, where did that come from? What's that about? Uh, exactly. Now, I live in the uh, Chicago suburbs, and um, we do have, uh, well, Chicago has a mayor that is... Uh, a lesbian, and uh, she dresses like a man. They do have a child, a child. Uh, it's I, I can't prove it, but oh, hang on, we'll be right back after a brief intermission. We are back, and uh, our guest the last two hours today is Michael S. Heath. His website is michaelheath.org, and I just I just got an email from a friend, and he said, don't forget that the last name of uh, Buddha gig or whatever begins with but. B-U-T-T. I, I just couldn't help but share that. Yes. It's, uh, that's a, a, a wonderful irony, I suppose. Yeah. I, I just find it just incredible uh, that the churches, as you indicate, are... Um, are upholding this, and we were talking about the mayor <coughs> in Chicago, and um, um, in the uh, chat room, somebody said that the mayor of Seattle uh, was, uh, they voted her in because she was a quote-unquote lesbian, and after they got rid of uh, this person, uh, well, because of pedophilia, so it's because when you endorse when you endorse one thing, you automatically endorse something else. The the reason this is happening, Deanna, is because the the good people, 
who know better, people who have common sense, and I still believe that that's a huge majority of our country, um, have been silenced by the sophisticated and enormously expensive campaign that's been waged against them through Hollywood, by Hollywood, and by uh, mainstream media, the sources of news that we, my, people my age and, and older, uh, came to trust after World War II, the, the big three television stations uh, and the uh. newspapers, the big city newspapers. Um, they have become an organ for making us feel guilty if we think certain thoughts or do certain things um, toward evil. Um, and so we have silenced ourselves. We're still here. Some people refer to it as a silent majority. I also think that it's more than just – I think I'm hopeful because, like I said before the break, I see evidence among millennials, the younger cohort, that – uh, there's an awakening going on with respect to what a family is and what marriage is and what human, how human sexuality works and what love is, what true love is. See, our silencing ourselves has been, has been the act of hate. But we've been forced to think that by being silent, by agreeing to go, by agreeing to, uh, disagree, by agreeing to disagree, um, in other words, we silence ourselves in the disagreement. So there's a disagreement here over homosexuality, and the majority, the people with common sense, have agreed and be silent. Right. Okay, we're at the top of the hour. We will be right back. And our guest the last two hours is Michael S. Heath. His website is Michael Heath. And we're having a, a very good conversation about something that needs to be discussed. And um, over the break, uh, well, before the break, I was thinking that uh, this has all been pretty much incremental uh, because uh, in Roe v. Wade uh, in 1973, um, the Supreme Court decided that it was okay to kill your children uh, before they were born, and which, um, in effect, uh, really devalued human beings and human life. And actually, she she never actually had an abortion. Uh, uh, she never had one. Norma, yeah, Norma McCorvey. Right. Um, from from an email, uh, the inmates, in effect, are now running the asylum. Yes. Uh, this is also so very disturbing. Um it just uh <laughs> it's disturbing but it needs to be talked about. And you have the courage to talk about this and for that I applaud you uh, greatly. I greatly applaud what you're doing. Thank you, Deanna. The the reason I came to do what I did was because my parents uh raised me a very typical vanilla middle class uh, upbringing in the state of Maryland and the United Methodist Church just everything normal and so Christianity was uh, not not um, 
it was there it, and it was real and it was the religion in our home but it wasn't everything and and i in my late teens i was confronting the issue of feeling guilty for sins and committed during my teen years we all i'm sure can identify with that and uh i was drawn to pentecostalism and deepened my commitment to christ in that culture and fell in love with the woman who is now my who's been my wife for 37 years and we've had three sons together and they're all grown and we have six grandchildren now. And then a uh, college degree in religion and philosophy leading to a interest in politics because I thought that that would be, I, I knew nothing about it. I wasn't raised in a political family. I just felt like uh, politics was a place in society where ideas met the real world and where ideas uh, would would collide with real, the real world in, in such a way that good work could be accomplished. And ended up as the leader of that group that I mentioned in the last hour, the Christian Civic League of Maine, in my early 30s, and, and led that ministry, the Christian Civic League of Maine, for two decades. And, as I said, decided to be the leader in the debate over whether or not homosexuality is is a good thing or not. And, of course, we took the, the perspective that it isn't and that we ought not to go in that direction. But we never, um, we, we never thought of ourselves as crusading. Um, probably we should. I, I, I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with, with a good old-fashioned uh, moral crusade against evil? This is part of our problem, Deanna. We can't, we've, we've emptied out the English language of, of words that mean, that are, that really mean things. And we've changed the words to mean things that they don't mean. You know, the, for the Crusades, for example, there were not, there were, I think there were close to a half dozen Crusades. And they were, to a large extent, a reaction to the threat that northern, northwestern Europe was feeling. Uh, from the rise of Islam in the Middle East. And the people of northwestern Europe felt threatened by Islam. Why did they feel threatened? Well, because Islam was making war on the people uh, on the frontiers of Western Europe. And so I think it was the French. They, uh, they, 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 they were sort of the, the heart of, of the reaction, the defensive war called the Crusades against Islam. But we, we never, we never talk about the fact that, uh, Islam was the aggressor and that they were making war on Northwest Europe, which was Christian. And so they felt threatened and they were reacting. Now, does that mean that every single act in the Crusades or that every single Crusade was justified or that what, you no, know, that's not my point. But my, my point is that we, we have allowed ourselves to, to be made to feel guilty about things that aren't true, that we haven't thought about, that, that are actually lies. These are complex matters, right? Wars are, are complicated things. And, uh, and these are wars that took place a thousand years ago. And we've come to believe that because we were the crusaders, right, Europe, European civilization, Christendom was the crusaders, that we need to spend the rest of our lives apologizing to the rest of the world. It's insane. Think that way. Not right. Because it's so, it's, so, it's so not true, not based on facts. It's, yeah. They've propagandized us. Right. Programmed We've us. It. Yes. Programmed us. Yes. Um, I want to read your. I want to read your books. I just while I'm on the show here, I've got my computer open and I'm looking at the book titles: "The Ruling Elite: Death, Destruction, and Domination." Yes, I, I've um, <laughs> recently. Um, 
they were taken off of um, Amazon. Amazon is, well, in, in line with what you're saying, uh, talking about is that um, the censorship of anybody that disagrees with, with prevailing thought, um, we have lost our power to to disseminate the truth uh, because if our if what we are saying doesn't agree with the prevailing theories uh, then we can be uh, censored and and uh, even okay Google um, the um, browser I recently removed that I don't use that browser anymore uh, because they will bring up you will not be they will put you in uh, maybe if somebody's looking for your name uh, it, it might be the be number 500 because they've decided that the, uh, the public should not be viewing your things. Uh, we've got uh, Snowden, who is is uh, who took refuge in Russia. Uh, we've got all kinds of people who have attempted to be truthful, um, whose work is now diminished to the point where nobody can find it. Uh, I think I think that has happened to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, have to... I thought it was I, I thought it was stunning when uh, Alex Jones was depersoned from the internet. I mean, they didn't just deplatform; they depersoned him. About the only thing left to him is his his website. And uh, think of him what you will. I mean. I don't agree with. I, I don't. I, I hesitate to say I don't agree with him about everything because that should go without saying. I mean, this is America. We, one of our cherished uh, ideals is 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 individual conscience. Is the idea that people at the level of the individual are free and encouraged to be free to speak their minds, and that our system is designed to weed out the bad ideas over time as a result of speech, as a result of reasoning together, as a result of debate, as a result of disagreement with one another based on the facts as we see them. And so part of the genius, I think, of the American experiment is the extent to which uh, we enabled that conversation by virtue of our constitution and our republican form of government, and the way that we designed it, and right, we're, throwing, we're 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 pitching all that stuff out the window. We're just throwing right. it away right now. Uh, this is the United States is not a democracy; they are a republic. Uh, the freedom of speech is guaranteed. Uh, if you don't like a certain program, you don't you don't. Listen to it. If you don't want to read a, a book, then you don't read it. Um, right. And or even better, or or even better, if you do, in America, if if you don't like an idea, if you don't like a book or whatever, yeah, you're free not to read it, but you're also free to disagree. Publicly. Absolutely. <laughs> but and, now, but, instead, now, but now you've got these mega powerful entities like Google and Facebook and Amazon, and they're just willy-nilly. And without and you, as like you're a publisher and you are on Amazon's platform, you should have the right to prevail in court uh, against Amazon simply because they took your, your book down. Right. Regard, you know, independent of what the ideas are in the book, um, because they, are, they represent themselves as a platform for... Uh, for a diversity of ideas. I mean, they're, they're the, that's the funny thing about this. The left is getting away with saying, oh, we love diversity. We're all for diversity. 
But they're not. I mean, they've become, the left has become the most censorious, uh, powerful censorious entity on the planet, the political left in the West. Right. And yet they do it in, in the name of celebrating diversity. And yet you will, fi- you will probably find all kinds of, of books on Amazon promoting things that the average person uh, would would never uh, look at read their or look at their cherished look at Go their ahead. cherished internet as it as it's currently constituted the most uh, the highest volume of traffic on the internet is pornography right it, it, and there's the there is uh, pornography of, of, of such a vile nature that the world has never seen it before, never even thought of the, the depths of depravity that people are now, quote, enjoying, end quote, as if it is free speech. In right. other words, pornography, pornography exists under, on the Internet because the left has argued that it is the symbol of free speech for uh, Hustler magazine to be free to disseminate their porn. That is the essence of free speech, pornography. Right. Well, back in October, I interviewed Brad Huddleston, who talks about this, pro- about all this stuff that you, that is available the pornography and and the introduction of pornography to children and I was absolutely stunned uh, and the addiction to pornography and yet um, yes it's an enormous it, it's an enormous problem it's something impossible to get your mind around how it is and destructive. it is and it's it's part of what we've been talking about during the entire program because it's 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 directly connected to this idea that all sex is good sex as long as it's consensual, and that you prove that you're a culture or a, a nation or a state or a group that cherishes free speech by tolerating pornography. We've come to believe that even many, perhaps most Christians believe that's true. That. We agree to disagree when it comes to the issue of pornography because, after all, adults are free to, you know. And, okay, but does that mean we, that, that, does that mean we can't even debate the subject anymore? Does that mean that there aren't other opinions related to whether or not pornography being available at this level of depravity and at this uh, frequency with a smartphone at the tap of a finger to any aged person on the planet uh, is this good for us? Is can we even talk, can we talk about it even? And increasingly, we're seeing the left wish to not debate the issue, but silence the people who might threaten their bottom line, or silence the people who might uh, challenge the idea that free speech equals pornography. It's 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 another. Av- example of how insane we've become, of how we've uh, given up on common sense, on just applying common sense right? the way we live. And, and you can fight back, certainly. You can take, remove Google, remove your Gmail accounts, uh, don't use uh, Google as a browser. Uh, you can certainly do that, but it would take a, a lot a lot of people to reject this, uh, but you can, you can, you, people have to protect themselves. Uh, yeah, in and any the problem, way that Deanna, they can. Yeah. Go ahead. And the problem, Deanna, for, for younger people who are in the workplace, the problem right now with what you're suggesting, which is turning off Google, which yes, they can do it, but if they're living under the pressure of current of emerging management styles in the workplace, right. and they're dealing with they're dealing with the need 
to have their data, their information available in a nanosecond across devices. In other words, on their smartphone, on their tablet, and on their desktop computer. They still even use a desktop computer. But the point is that their data needs to be instantly available to them in a format that they can work with in an efficient amount of time. And it is nigh on impossible to create digital platforms that can pull that off across multiple devices and multiple websites. Right. And, multiple. and and so Google is the leader in, you know, there's basically three options. There's two big options when it comes to productivity, Google and Microsoft. And then uh, there's three options when move when you bring certain aspects of the productivity world in, and that's Apple. Um, so, and so those those are your options, and you don't really have other options that are really efficient, real super efficient. Um, right. Google Google just you know, works on your phone. It works on your laptop. It works on your desktop. And people don't want to become technologists, right? They don't want to have to figure out why it works. They don't want to think about it. They just want it to work. Right. And right. So this is a real challenge for the uh, folks in the workplace, especially the younger folks. And in, in the educational programs, uh, they insist that everybody have a, um, a tablet at school or iPad or, or technology. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And so technology is, uh, hang on, we'll be right back in three minutes. website is michaelheath.org and when we went to break I mentioned that um, uh, students were now given uh, technology in the classroom uh, which really eliminates linear thinking and makes them more programmable and less teachable Um, and it is programming them to not think but to think a particular way based on the information that they are being fed. Right. The issue of technology is, of course, huge now with the Internet and smartphone, especially the smartphone. Um, And... The big one. I, a book that uh, I was just looking for it. I, I read it earlier this year. That's worth reading. Uh, I encourage it. I encourage your readers to look it up. And uh, life after Google: the fall of big data and the rise of the blockchain. Fall of big ah. data and the rise of the blockchain. Life after Google by George Gilder. He's a he's a Christian man, but he's he's not known so much for that as uh, books that he's written in the past that have proved prescient. He's accurately, he's been an accurate predictor of the big picture of digital technology and for many decades he has been. I think he's in his 80s now. But that book was a real eye-opener uh, for me because it helped me think into uh, the, the fact that the smartphones are, are ubiquitous and that the Internet is essential to uh, product productivity in life now. That wasn't the case, Deanna, when when, uh, when you were writing your books and when we were uh, working on political issues and thinking about political issues uh, 15, 20, 30 years ago. 
Um, right. But it is tr- but it is a fact now that it is it is here, and you if you want if you have to work to earn a living to feed your family, you're going to have to use it. Uh, it's right. not an option. Right. Now you can still you can still survive somewhat if you're not working in uh, tired or whatever. If you're from a personal perspective, you can probably survive. I mean, certainly you can eat and you can survive materially. But if you want to, uh, you're interested in ideas. If you're if you're uh, enjoying entertainment. You know, increasingly television shows, dramas, movies, whatever. It's all coming to us digitally now instead of in an analog fashion. It's right. Now, it's now coming to us uh, through the Internet. And so, and speaking of analog, uh, they, they now surveil your house uh, with the uh, smart meter, which is uh, unconstitutional. Um, they have no right to to surveil you and your activities uh, without a search warrant, and yet that is what what the smart meters are doing, and people don't my, recognize my predict- that. Yeah, my my hope for the future is I, I I I don't think that the internet or computers are the only thing that would cause them to, to disappear would be if electricity disappeared. Um, because the internet and computers are, they're just, their code and their, uh, elements in the, that appear in nature that are organized into hardware and electricity. So if electricity stops flowing, then okay, the internet's gonna stop being a thing, but the likelihood of electricity not flowing again ever, uh, is pretty minuscule. So it's with us. It's something we're gonna have to, Tame. It's something we're going to have to develop an etiquette for. And I believe that just as every generation prior to ours, before us, has developed an etiquette to manage the presence of new technologies in our lives, humanity is going to develop an etiquette that will manage the presence of the Internet and smartphones and computers and smart meters and all of these things in our lives. One of the things that I think could really change the uh, power equation, so to speak, is to, is to enable the individual to win uh, privacy lawsuits. To, you know, for example, if you have a smart meter and you don't, and you feel that you're being surveilled, you feel that the uh, the meter is being used to invade your privacy, then you need to be able to win in court on that. And, uh, um, on the issue of privacy. And now, you should be able to do that, and there have been some people who have attempted to do that uh, in a community adjacent, the community that I live in, and uh, they lost. Uh, okay, we'll be right back in three minutes. And be heroes if we take the lead. All righty, we are back with our guest, Michael S. Heath. And uh, we're talking about, um, well, we're talking about a lot of things. Uh, talking about uh, smart meters and the idea that we could possibly take them to court. Um, but uh, there are so many people that have been programmed to accept these, including, uh, I have a neighbor who worked for, who used to work for, um, well, let's see, ComEd. And um, she didn't see anything wrong with smart meters. And I said, well, what about all the employees who who are hired to, to read your meter? And it, we could say the same thing about all the retail markets that are shutting down and people that used to be in the retail markets, such as working for Sears or or Pennies or one of those companies, uh, as Amazon becomes more popular and you can get anything that you want on Amazon 
and it's delivered to your doorstep, then a lot of these other retail shops, Sears, Penny's, uh, all these places, are going to dismiss the people that work for them. Now, what are they supposed to do for an income? It just seems like it's just a, a, a sad thing, a terrible thing to consider what is happening to the economy as a result of the monopolization of certain entities. Yep. Well, there's no doubt that we're going through a major shift in our way our society functions, but this isn't the first time, obviously, in human history that that's happened. And right. And uh, won't be the last unless things come to an end, Jesus returns. Um, so uh, we are going to grapple with this, and we are going to overcome it. Um, I don't think that the uh, great unifiers at the top, the people who have this uh, vision, this multicultural vision, this one sort of one world vision, believing after those two horrific world wars that by uh, by creating an entity where all the nations can come together and and eventually form a, a one world government, I don't think that idea is going to prevail. I, obviously, we're at a dangerous point in American world history on that question. Right. Because George Soros is is investing his money uh, efficiently and prudently to promote his ideology, and uh, the West is very weak on this point of national sovereignty. But the West is in a boil uh, politically and culturally and religiously over this very issue right now, and uh, so it's the the in in some ways the fight is just beginning on this question of it's begin let me put it this way it's beginning anew in my lifetime i have seen the complexion of this debate politically and culturally and religiously change dramatically the the debate has much more of a religious uh focus than it ever did in in my lifetime before um religion is is very a very big part of the debate now about borders, and to quote Michael Savage, borders, language, and culture. Um, mm-hmm. Religion is is huge, and I think it's going to become even bigger as time goes on. And, and as I think that's, and I and I think that's that's as it should be. That's as that's as it has to be, because you, the left can't hide the fact that the uh, turmoil in northwestern Europe is in large part because the people who are fleeing their failed states uh, in Africa and the Middle East are Islamic, they're Muslim. And and so the, the, the collision is that's looming, that's coming, is very religious. Look at the, I, I don't know, Deanna, if you followed the situation with uh, Tommy Robinson, but that's a fascinating story. Oh, I haven't. In, in, in England. Well, t- Tommy Robinson is, a young, is an Irishman. He's probably, uh, he grew up in Luton, England, apparently a big city. I've never been there. I don't know much about it. But uh, Tommy Robinson uh, became uh, energized to react to the fact that Muslim immigrants were banding, young men, young Muslims who had immigrated to Luton, his hometown, were banding together to form rape gangs. And they were grooming oh, yes. young, British, oh, my gosh. Young, young, British, young British girls for, for rape there in Luton. And he decided to take matters into his own hands early earlier in his life, 10 years ago or so. And he would uh, go to the Muslim quarter of Luton, and he would get into fist fights with these guys, and they would they would end up putting him in the hospital. And like a good Irishman, he took matters into his own fists, and he and he confronted the issue head on. So he made a name for himself doing that. Uh, I like to think he didn't do it for the purpose of making a name for himself. He doesn't appear to me to be that kind of a person. 
but he uh, ended up writing a book, and he's become such a problem to the, uh, the government, which is, of course, on the side of all of this immigration that uh, they're in England, that they jailed him and they put him in solitary confinement and they've, they've, they've engaged, they, the government, has engaged in all sorts of persecution that's unjust against this man, Tommy Robinson. Wow. And, uh, it has, at, at its root is, is, is a conflict over, uh, religion and sexuality. So it's a conflict over Islam and how sexuality is gonna, uh, play out in uh, western states in in Christ, in what used to be called Christendom in the in the in western civilization and this is a very current uh, conflict that's going on i i think robinson he's he's spent a lot of time this year in jail and he's out of jail now and he's talking about uh he's 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 very uh he's effective in social media of course, he's been thrown off Facebook. That's where he had built his largest following, but they threw him off earlier this year. So he's regrouping on some of the alternative platforms and planning to continue to produce uh, content on the Internet. And this is the, an exciting development, Deanna, on the Internet, is is platforms like the one that we're on uh, tonight, which is called uh, Republic Broadcasting, Public mm-hmm. Broadcasting Network. Um this is one of the really exciting developments is website-based uh, platforms for the dissemination of any kind of content that can be distributed digitally. And that, right. can, be, that can be anything written. That can be anything uh, in the form of, a, of an image. It can, be, uh, li- it can now be uh, live videos streaming. Um, right. It can be produced, produced very efficiently. Uh, and... This is such an exciting development. These, and that's pretty new. Um, it, it's new in the sense that it's affordable. Right. It's becoming, it's becoming very, very affordable. And so these big companies that have a lock on our on our attention, Facebook, Google, are in for competition, the likes of which they've never experienced before in their existence. And remember, these big companies are very young, Deanna, right? I mean, they're only 10 they years are old. relatively young. Yes, they're only they're only ten, fifteen years old, and the internet is 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 that old. About right. That old. So, so uh, we one are just... thing that I have found very interesting uh, regarding the um, the immigration of um, people from the Middle East is the fact that that a um, that they were militarized by a faction within the government who worked with a college and a college professor to militarize a certain group of people and then go in and make war in the Middle East uh, with the intention that um, these young immigrants, people who are leaving one place, to go to another would have nothing but hatred uh, for the people who had bombed them uh, and caused war and destroyed their countries. Uh, So you have to look at, okay, what initiated this hatred? Who's behind this multiculturalism? And um, exactly how this occurred and why it occurred. Right, so it's, yeah, it's like, so. and I, I think we've 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 become lazy in our thinking about war itself. We Americans have become lazy in our thinking about war. It's the last thing we should want. We should devote considerable energy to making sure that war is not a thing. But we've become lazy in our thinking, and we think it's like we're in a perpetual war. We're always making you know, war is. As- Almost, it's almost like war is a continuous moral good, and it's not. War should is in its very, in its very, in its essence, something that you avoid almost at all costs, almost at all costs. It happens. Absolutely, but the people in Congress love war because they 
they go and they make these um, make a, a lot of money uh, because they know what to invest in, and they go to uh, Washington as regular folks with a regular income, and they come back as millionaires. Uh, why don't we yeah. take a phone call? We have a have a caller, Mark in uh, Mark in Florida. Mark. Oh, yes. Thanks for letting me in, Deanna. Um, you guys mentioned that uh, the people were fleeing, uh, the Muslims were, were fleeing the failed Muslim countries, and I suppose they'd be taking their failed Muslim beliefs with them because they're uh, undereducated, and just like all Americans don't know the truth behind everything. But it seems to me that that uh, the Muslim religion is a creation by the Bolshevik Babylonians uh, to compete with Christianity, and we're just uh, it's just we're just suffering under uh, a form of Bolshevism. Bolshevik, right. I guess. Yes, I would agree. What What do you think? I can't really comment on the Bolshevik thing because I haven't studied it. Uh, I, I associate the Bolshevik uh, the the word Bolshevism with Russia in the uh, early 20th century. Mm-hmm. So, is, well, I would compare so, it with the uh, Babylonian uh, uh, Jews, the Jewish government. It's not a religion, it's a form of government, and it's more Babylonian, and I would just associate the uh, Bolsheviks with uh, the Babylonian Jewish cartel. Well, I see. Uh, bringing it forward, uh, the actual communism and capitalism were created by the same entity, uh, which it was originally called the European Plan. And the European Plan uh, created both capitalism and communism and designed to be opposites. Uh, but when, the, when, you, when you create both systems, then you can also control both systems and uh, All right. set up the, the dynamics. Down, down to yellow. And the but it's it's called the European Plan, which I write about in my one of my books. I don't well, remember which one. It's where the it's where the state is the master, uh, and the state is just a disguise for a gang of bad men. And uh, thanks right. for letting me in. Right. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for your call. Uh, I was going to com- uh, I was going to comment, Deanna, on. Uh, Oh, a, a book, very short book that was an eye opener for me, which I, which you're probably familiar with, was uh, r- uh, published, written and published in 1935 by uh, a Marine, uh, Smedley Butler. And oh yes, he, my my grandfather was his aide. A war oh, is no a racket. Kidding. Right, a war and is a racket. They, they they did a lot of things together. They uh, co-wrote a book together. And my grandfather was with him in China, uh, in the Dominican Republic, and uh, elsewhere. So and for five. Yes, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, with uh, the general. I have two two sons who are Marines. And for five. Yes. Um, did that book that book's a must a must read. War is a racket. Absolutely. War is a racket. And it's free. It's, it's, on, it's on the internet. Yeah, you can sure get it on is. the internet. Yeah, all you got to do is Google it, and it's everywhere. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for your phone call, Mike. What are your thoughts? Um. Yeah. On technology. Uh. Back on. If I could for a moment, uh, expand a bit on George Gilder's. Uh, book Life After Google: The Fall of Big Data. Yes. And the ri- rise of the blockchain economy. Um, he he uh, posits that at the software layer, um, we're going to see that's where there's going to be a uh, dramatic change and revolution. Not so much with hardware as with uh, software, and it's it's going to be a development that creates a new uh, techno- a new paradigm that will um, bring more security 
to the individual uh, who is using the Internet. This is Gilder's belief. His argument is is technical um, in the book, Life After Google. Um, I've read it, read it, listened to it a few times, and uh, it's sufficiently persuasive to give me hope that uh, we are going to uh, create this needed etiquette for social media and for websites and for communications and use of the Internet. And this is going to be one of the ways that it emerges. That sounds, uh, that sounds good. I'm going to have to – I've already got it. Yes, I'm going to get that book, Life After Google. Um, because we do have choices. But if people, people don't know what they don't know. And uh, so that's why we have uh, well-informed guests like yourself on the program who can um, introduce us to these different um, different methods and different ways of dealing with the situation that we find ourselves in. Okay, we're going to a quick three-minute break. We'll be right back. All righty, welcome back. Our guest the last two hours has been Michael F. Heath. His website is michaelheath.org, and we're just about out of time. Um, what uh, would you like to give us? Uh, we've, we've just got just a few minutes. Um, yeah, if, if, I, if I could mention that if you go, if your listeners uh, go to michaelheath.org, then they can access all 150 columns I've written this year at the email archive tab. They can subscribe if they'd like to receive the column in their email box. I publish it at 5 o'clock a.m. every weekday morning. And I would also uh, mention, Deanna, that I produce a live stream for 30 minutes at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube uh, Periscope, which is Twitter's live streaming platform, and Facebook, and that program is also archived for viewing later or for listening to at michaelheath.org. So um, that's another opportunity for your listeners to continue the conversation with me. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, and <laughs> you get up very early. You're very busy uh, producing and um uh, producing things that help others, and that says a lot about you. And uh, yeah, our ministry is called. My wife and I have a ministry called Helping Hands Ministries. We just returned from uh, Guatemala, uh, where we were present for ten days, supporting English-speaking missionaries serving uh, overseas. And we uh, also have developed a high trust relationship with a surgeon. Uh, in Guatemala, and so uh, we have acquired two, my wife and I, two surgeries in Guatemala over the past three years because we we have not had the financial resources to afford insurance for most of our uh, life, and so we use, we are very, um, you know, we're very mindful of how much medical care costs, especially when you get into surgery. And my wife needed a surgery this time, and she had it. And the surgery uh, cost us in Guatemala $2,600. And we learned when we returned home that had we done it here, this surgery would have been in somewhere between fifty and $100,000. Wow. And Unfortunately, the surgery uncovered uh, a very uh, aggressive form of cancer and left ovary, and we learned that news last um, Saturday. And so, uh, fortunately, the ovary was removed, the capsule was not broken, so the cancer was contained, the CAT scan has come back negative, and we're in the middle of uh, praying through what is the best course of action in response to the presence of high-grade serous carcinoma, my uh, seven-year-old abdomen. So we're 
been uh, an, a roller coaster ride for us over the last three weeks. Wow. Well, bless you and bless your your work and give your wife a hug for me and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Thank All you right. Work. Thank you. Bye bye now. You. God bless you also.